we invited people to come to Jesus, to come and be saved. Now, I'm not saying that there's not anything wrong with a response or an invitation. But Jesus said, I have come to seek and to save that which was lost. So secondly, it points out the fact that God is actively searching and seeking out the lost. Thirdly, each one of these three parables reveals to us that God rejoices in those who are lost being found. God rejoices. We've heard that, that the angels rejoice when a soul is saved on this earth. But even back in the Old Testament, it talks about God rejoicing over you. And each one of these parables... We find, we find the character rejoicing when that which was lost is found. Not only does he rejoice, but he invites others to take part in his joy as well. Now, since we've covered the whole 15th chapter of John, would y'all like to dismiss in prayer? Now, I want us to take a look at, the, at these passages, and I realize, uh, hopefully, since we had a short business meeting, hopefully we'll get through all 32 verses. How about that? Just remember that all three parables tell the same story. The importance of one. The fact that God is actively searching and seeking out that one. And that God rejoices over that one. And he invites us to rejoice with him. So let's begin in verse 1, Luke in chapter 15. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him, and the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Now I want to stop right there just a moment and let's clarify who these publicans and sinners were. Some, some of your Bibles may say tax collectors and sinners, or tax collectors and heathen. In Jesus' day, there basically were two classifications of tax collectors. There were those who were Roman by birth, those who went out and collected taxes on behalf of Caesar who were natural Roman citizens, and then there were those vagabond Jews or those Jews who ultimately had taken an office of tax collector on behalf of Caesar. Either way, they, both groups, both the Roman tax collectors and the Jewish tax collectors were hated by the Jewish people. The sinners that they refer to were all of these other people whom they considered not worthy of worship, not worthy of sacrifice, not worthy to enter into the temple or the, or the tabernacle, the synagogue. In other words, those who were just a little bit lower than us, that was their mindset. These could have been a conglomeration of, of Jew, Jewish or, or people who had been derived from the Jewish nation. For instance, the Samaritans. It could have been people who were outside of the seed of Abraham. For instance, the Gentiles. Anyone and everyone who did not agree with the Pharisees and the scribes and their law and their interpretations of the law... They would have been considered heathen or sinners. Now, obviously, we have in verse 2 the description of the Pharisees and the scribes. It says that they murmured. Isn't it amazing how much murmuring there, took, there was that took place in the Bible? Each and every time that God provided a means of escape, whether it be of bondage or hunger or thirst or salvation, or sacrifice. It seems like those people who were called to be his were the ones who were murmuring the most. Now, another word for murmuring is moaning, griping. We've got all kinds of words that we could label those folks with. They were complainers. 
They were the naysayers. They were those who voted no, no matter what. Just so they could have their voice heard. And they began to murmur or moan or complain that Jesus was receiving or Jesus was allowing these people whom they considered unworthy to follow him, to be in his presence. Not only that, but he was eating with them. He was fellowshipping with them. As Jesus opens up in response to their murmuring, he paints the picture for us. You know, it's easy for us sometimes as we look at people who are not like us to not like them. But it also shows us the imperative nature of the gospel to whom we're to carry it to. You see, the scribes and the Pharisees thought they were righteous enough, so they didn't need it. They didn't need the gospel. They didn't need the Messiah. They didn't need salvation. After all, they were, they were doing good works. They were sacrificing on a regular basis. They were attending synagogue or, or temple worship. They were tithing. They were living by the letter of the law, but the one thing that they left out, actually two, were the fact of God's grace and the fact of God's mercy. They were unwilling to give to those who were in need. And they were unwilling to share with those who were in need. In other words, they weren't very compassionate or empathetic. Compassion Compassion comes from within and it reaches out to those who are out, without. Mercy begins within and it sees those that are without. And so those were two elements that the scribes and Pharisees lacked greatly those areas of grace and of mercy. And so they look at those people who were coming to Jesus, <laughs> who were following Jesus, who were hearing Jesus, who were responding to Jesus. In verse 3, And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Jesus gives us the parable of the lost sheep. Some would question, why would a shepherd who's caring for a flock of sheep leave 99 just to go search for that one? Remember I said God is actively seeking? It's because he saw the value of that one. We can make the assumption that perhaps he knew that the ninety and nine were together and they would not leave, but that one who was lost would not, be, would not return. It's been said that sheep are the, some of the dumbest animals on the, on the face of this earth. They spook real easy. They get lost real easy. They take constant watch and it takes constant care. I don't know how many of you have been around sheep, but if you have been around sheep very long, you notice how their wool gets so thick and all of a sudden it begins to get matted. You have to lead sheep to pasture. You have to lead sheep to water. That sound familiar? Look at Psalms 23. 
where the psalmist David says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leadeth me to green pastures. He leads me to still waters. Jesus points out the value of the one lost sheep. Not the 99 that are still there. This also points out the fact that that lost sheep still belonged to the shepherd. Now some would say, well, you know what? People belong to the Lord whether they realize it or not. If you think about it, we all are created in God's image. In the likeness of He and His Son and His Spirit. Therefore, we belong to Him. But as Isaiah said, all we, like sheep, have gone astray. So God comes actively seeking and searching for that one lost sheep. The second parable that Jesus shares with us is the parable of a woman who's lost a coin. Many say that this coin represents perhaps a portion of her dowry that when she was married, and if you go back and you do a little bit of research in, uh, in uh, Jewish wedding ceremonies, oftentimes the women wore a headdress, literally of coins latched or looped together. And this would be the bride's from the day that she married until the day that her husband departed, if he died before her, that, that, would, that each and every coin that was in that headdress would serve for her financial stability later in life. You might call it a retirement fund. But Jesus begins this way in verse 8. He says, either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it. And when she has found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the piece which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of angels of God in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Now, we, we cannot help but notice that Jesus likens the lost sheep to being found having repentance. He likens the lost coin to being found having repentance. Now think about this for a minute. If you like me, and, and uh, I'm pretty good with numbers. One sheep out of a hundred is what fraction? One percent. Jesus is concerned with one percent. One coin out of ten is what percentage? 10%. Jesus is concerned with the 10%. Jesus begins to narrow it down. He goes on to say, in verse 11, and he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Give me the portion of goods that falleth to me, and he divideth unto him his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into, into the, his fields of, to feed the swine. 
And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare, and I perish? With hunger I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran. And fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Now I want to stop right there for just a moment because we need to talk a little bit about the prodigal son as we know the story so well. Normally, a child would not receive their inheritance until after their parent had died. But it was also permissible in these days to go ahead and divide up the inheritance to permit the child to perhaps have a head start in life. And I know that perhaps some of you or all of you at some time or the other, you've helped your child out either to buy a car or, or, or to buy this or to buy that, maybe to buy a home or whatever it may be, maybe just to buy a tank of gas or pay their insurance. The father must know that this young man is obviously going to squander all of his inheritance. But nonetheless, he gives it to him anyway. One commentator points out, and I can't remember exactly who it was, but one commentator points out that God sometimes relents to human will. If you think about it for a moment, if you think about it for a moment, God gave Adam a command. He told Adam, he said, Adam, of all of the trees in the garden you can eat, except for the one tree in the center of the garden. And the day that you eat of it, did you get that? You shall die. All Adam had to do was simply obey God and follow his command to eat of every other tree. Because God had warned him that the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And the serpent, in his wisdom, beguiled Eve and Adam both. They looked at the tree. They saw the tree was good for fruit. It looked good. It looked good to eat. Maybe it had a fragrant odor to it. Perhaps the bees were swarming around it. There were other animals, or there were animals that were perhaps grazing under it, picking up the fruit that perhaps had fallen on the ground. But God had said, the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And so Satan said, Eve, did God really say that you would die? Adam Do you really think that God really meant that you would die? You see, what Satan does is that Satan proposes that God is a liar. When he made the proposition to both Eve and Adam there in the Garden of Eden, ultimately what he was saying was that God 
didn't tell you the truth. Because he knew that when you ate of it, that you would be just like him. Now, Satan likes to deal in half-truths, does he not? You know what a half-truth is? It's a lie. The Bible calls him the great deceiver. He tempted Jesus when he was in the wilderness, and he quoted Scripture doing it. Many people would, would come across someone quoting them Scripture, and they would say, you know what, they must really be close to God. They know the Word of God so well. But Satan, once again, presented himself. In one fashion, and he presented God as a liar. So God gives, he relents to human free will. And because of that, we are born naturally sinners. But remember, God is actively searching and seeking out those who are lost. He speaks to us through His Word. He draws us through His Spirit until we come to the point in which we repent and we come to Him or we receive Him. But God is actively seeking us. He's actively calling us. And this young man, when he, it came a time of famine in the land, and notice this, for a young Jewish boy, we make the assumption that Jesus is talking about a Jewish father and his two Jewish sons, for a Jewish boy to go out and to feed hogs. It was the most degrading and defiled act that a Jew could do. After all, cloven hoof animals were forbidden in the Old Testament. But he looks at what the hogs are eating. Notice this. This is how bad his want had become. The King James Version says that he looked at the husk. <laughs> and he had that desire just to eat what the hogs were eating. I want you to notice this also. Verse 16. And no man gave unto him. Man could not give him what would fill his greatest need. And so he devises a plan and he rehearses it within his own mind. And he begins on his trek home. And when he's some distance from his father's house, as he's rehearsing this over and over and over in his mind, his father looks out and he sees him. And notice this. His father ran to him. His father didn't cross his arms and kick back in the recliner and said, let's just see how far he comes. Let's just see if he comes all the way. I deserve an apology. I'm not giving him anything unless he comes begging and pleading and on his knees. No, he didn't say that. Verse 20, it says, His father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Here it is, this Jewish young boy has been out feeding the hogs. And I don't know if you, how many of you have been around hogs. That's not a smell that you can just wash off. His father came to him in his filth. His father came to him perhaps in his tattered clothes. His father, father came to him perhaps by this time he 
was, his face was drawn, his ribs were showing. His father came to him when he had no shoes. And he ran to him. And he fell on him with it. He hugged his neck. He squeezed him up tight and he kissed him. And this son begins to rehearse everything. He begins to go over everything word for word, just like he's rehearsed it. Father, I've sinned against you and I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. And I'm no more worthy to be called your son. And it's as if the father never heard a word he said. His father knew the condition that he was in. But he had compassion to him and he ran to him and he fell on him and he kissed him. And he said to his servants, notice this, bring forth the best robe. And put it on him. And put a ring on his hand. Now, bringing forth the best robe is... That best robe would be reserved for the person of prominence in the house. Perhaps it could have even been his father's own robe. He didn't tell the servants, listen... Go look back in the very back side of my closet, that old moth-ridden robe that's been hanging there for years that no one ever wears anymore, and give it to him. No, he said, bring forth the best robe. He clothed him. He said, and put a ring on his finger. You see, a ring was a symbol of status. The son who'd been wallowing with the hogs had all of a sudden been lifted up out of that miry pit. And he says, bring the fatted calf. Put shoes on his feet. Let's eat. And be merry. Now notice this. He says, let us eat and be merry. Remember, God rejoices over that one. And he calls us to, to take part in his joy with him. To rejoice with him. Now, some would say that this parable is actually two parables wrapped into one because we find in, in the story another character comes to light. It's his brother. Remember, he had a brother who had stayed there, who had worked the family farm, who had taken care of business, who had cared for his father. Verse 25, now... His elder son was in the field, and he came and drew nigh to the house. He heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and entreated him, and he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years I do serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, and thou hast killed for him the fatted calf, and he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry. In other words, it was necessary that we should have joy. Make merry and be glad. For this thy brother, notice this, was dead 
and is alive again. And was lost and is found. How often, folks, how often do we rejoice? Now notice in this parable, we don't find the word repentance. But we find repentance in action. The sheep did not turn around and come back to the fold. The coin didn't, didn't roll itself back into the widow's hand <coughs> or the lady's hand. But the son who recognized his condition, who made a direct Opposite turn, a 180. And returned to his father and pleaded with his father. And he said, It was meat, it was necessary that we should exhibit joy. Because he was dead. His brother wasn't dead, was he? Yes. This is a picture of spiritual death. For the person who lives riotous ways and sinful ways. The person who needs salvation the most is the person who's lost the worst. <laughs> if there is such a degree. He says he was lost and is found. He didn't scold his brother who came with an angry response. Some of your Bibles, some of your some translations use the word instead of son. In verse 31, it uses the word child. And in the Greek language, the word that's used here denotes the tenderest, most compassionate title that he could give him. He, he recognized, he knew the relationship that he and this son had had. It's a calming embrace that he gives to the angry one. It's an assuring or reassuring hug when he tells him that your brother was dead and he's alive. And he was lost and he's found. God rejoices over that one. Whether it be one in a hundred, one in ten, or one in two. But God loves the whole lot. The shepherd didn't reject or neglect the other ninety-nine. The woman didn't forget about the other ten. Father embraced both of his sons, just as God does for you and I. When we repent and we turn of our sins, when each and every tax collector, sinner, heathen, harlot, drug addict, alcoholic, devout sinner, Responds to his invitation. He rejoices. And folks, as the church, he calls us to rejoice with him.